This presentation starts with an update. Recently, Riley McKee was found. Details will be kept vague upon request of the family. Um, but I will play you this clip from Dark Snowvia. There are some good news. What I've been informed by my so sources, Rayleigh McKee has been found. This is good. Because the worst could have easily had happened. And it's good that some good news, for once, um, has been given to me. This is the kind of stuff that Antifa does to help the, and serve the people. People that are missing, they help find them. Now, I don't have all the details about what happened. I don't know how much the family feels comfortable with sharing. I'm just reporting on it so people can know what happened. And the people... Her family is grateful that Antifa helped her. And for those of you who are out there, even if it's a small thing I've done, I hope my reporting in a small way helped contribute to her safe return. If it, if it has, I am, that makes me feel like I've done something, that I'm doing something useful that I'm actually making a difference even if it's something like this do not forget what's going on in Arizona majority of the time when people go missing over there you don't get a anything but a horrible ending for many people and Rayleigh McKee is one of the rare exceptions that did not suffer a fate she could have suffered from. Thank you to everyone that spread the video. Rayleigh McKee, if you're watching this, her family, thank. I'm glad I if I did anything to, to help have her found, that makes me feel like I've done my job right or I've done something to make a difference. May the force be with you always and keep up the good fight those in Arizona who are suffering the boot of fascist violence. So in other news in Arizona, there has been the controversy of Carrie Lake. Now, for those who do not remember Carrie Lake, she used to be part of Arizona's uh, local Fox station. I believe it's Fox 10. Uh, she would then get into politics. Uh, throughout my teens, I was not in Arizona. I was actually in Brooklyn. Um, and I had not returned to Arizona until I was 18. There's a lot more about my life that I would not want to get into. But what I'm trying to say is like my reference in Carrie Lake is vague. I do remember her more a bit in the past before I went to Brooklyn. Um, but, you know, it's, it's vague. Um, so you can imagine how, like, foolish I felt when I found out that Carrie Lake has been in politics now for some time. But, uh, she seems to have been very much in support of the Jan 6 coup attempt. So, um, this next piece is called Carrie Lake Wants Access to 2022 Ballots from Maricopa County. It, uh, came up on YouTube on September 21st of 2023. Um, this is from the Channel 12 news, by the way, which uh, is uh, is basically NBC. Uh, Arizona's NBC local news is what this is. All right, so here we go. Carrie Lake has already lost two trials connected to the 2022 election, and now she finds herself in the middle of a third. The former Republican candidate for governor was in a Maricopa County courtroom this afternoon, proving that she deserves access to your ballot signature from November's election. Joe Dana was in the court and tells us why the county argues that those signatures should remain private. County recorder Stephen Richer testified that he simply cannot, by law, release to the public 
the signatures on voter ballot envelopes. We're going to show up to a knife fight with a gun, not a knife. She tried to prove fraud, raised questions about ballot tabulator machines. The truth is on our side. And accused election workers of wrongdoing. Carrie Lake has lost every legal battle since the election. Now she's suing to get access to see voters' signatures. It's in the best interests of the state and the people to be able to understand what is taking place in their elections. Things that we check. County recorder Stephen Richard testified Thursday the voting affidavit and all information on it are sacred. If those signatures were made public, would you have concerns about whether that could threaten election integrity in any way? I would have a lot of concerns. It's not just people who are in our community who might have a legitimate purpose. It would be anyone in the world. The fear that bad actors could commit fraud or disrupt elections. Jen Fifield reports for the nonprofit Vote Beat and has been following the case. So there is a question here then about whether the signature on the envelope is a public record. There is a question. For years and for decades, actually, in Maricopa County and across the state, county recorders have thought of these as not public records. They thought of them as part of the private voter information you give, like your last four, your social, and they haven't been giving them out. But now there's a challenge to that saying in state law, it might not actually be protected. Lake has a history of spreading election lies. Attorney Tom Ryan represents a former election official who was harassed because of false election conspiracies. This isn't about getting to um, an important question that may help Arizona. This is about getting information and data about uh, election workers and voters so that they can be harassed. And that's a real deep concern. The trial resumes Monday with more witnesses and closing arguments. A defeated candidate once again in court trying to convince a judge she deserves at least one victory. Joe Dana, 12 News. And uh, this uh, next clip from the same channel uh, came out on September 25th, 2023. And uh, it's, uh, it's titled Closing Arguments in Carrie Lake Ballot Case. I think that this is appropriate upon the video that just played just now. A judge has heard closing arguments in Carrie Lake's latest legal challenge related to the 2022 election. Lake is suing in an attempt to get access to voter signatures on mail-in ballot envelopes. Joe Dana was in the courtroom and he's joining us live in the studio with the latest. Joe? Carrie Lake's attorneys could not even get one witness on the stand during the two-day trial. It reflects a larger theme we've seen since Lake began making claims of fraud in the elections. What Lake says in front of crowds or on social media is often not considered credible enough to be considered in a courtroom. It's hard to argue a case without witnesses. I just do not find that that's relevant. But once again, for the second day in a row, Superior Court Judge John Hanna blocked potential witnesses from testifying on behalf of Carrie Lake in her public records lawsuit against Maricopa County. The bottom line is the request uh, to call those witnesses is denied. The judge has either labeled witnesses for Lake not credible or not capable of providing relevant information. It is a zero in the analysis. Despite portraying confidence about her election fraud claims in the past, the truth is on our side. The former TV anchor and defeated governor's candidate has had no success in election-related lawsuits. Judges have not only ruled against Lake in two trials, but they fined Lake's attorneys $2,000 in one case and $122,000 in another for making false and frivolous claims. In this trial, Lake's attorney argues they were illegally denied access to review signatures of mail-in voters, more than 1.3 million in the county. The very purpose, Your Honor, of the Public Records Act is to ensure that the people can serve as a check on the activities of government. County recorder Stephen Richard testified images on the envelopes are considered part of the voter registration record, off limits to the public. The county also argues the contentious political climate is why Richard is justified to keep signatures from being released. It can lead to voter harassment, can lead to voter disenfranchisement. One witness for the county testified she left her position as an election worker after 31 years on the job, in part because of harassment. I had uh, lots of different ways that my picture was being circulated around social media um, with several captions uh, highlighting the word treason. 
Now, the county has previously demonstrated they followed the law regarding signature curing and verification. Judge Hanna says he plans to issue a ruling very soon on this public records lawsuit. And Joe, uh, attorneys for Lake, they made the point that our signatures are everywhere. I mean, they're mm -hmm. a part of property records. I mean, you even sign your signature on a receipt at a restaurant. Yep. So what is different about the ballot signatures? Well, two things. One, uh, the recorder's office argues that uh, the Constitution protects your sacred right to vote. That should remain private. And two, uh, they're saying even if information is available somewhere else, case law dictates that uh, if there's an interest for the state to protect information, they should still do it. So we'll wait and see how the judge rules on this. All right, Joe, thank you for that update. Okay. Now that we've gone through that, um, I think that the next and most appropriate thing to go through is a conversation with Dr. Weisfeld, the Jewish Bundist, and Steve Struggle, the Black Panther. This is the latest conversation that they had. And um, it, it is a very insightful conversation. Please do not hesitate to give out criticisms, compliments, affirmations, uh, critiques, questions, you know. And one thing that I would uh, criticize a lot of people for right now is just that not enough people try to engage with Dr. Weisfeld. Um, I will become less and less available throughout this year and the next year as I'm, I am working on a much more uh, different project for the Boond and for Arizona particularly. And the Boond is much larger than Arizona. And while I did have the presence to speak more on the broader level, I am narrowing down my scope. And I have to. Um, there are a lot more younger Boondists that will be taking you know, over soon, I hope. Um, and I, 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 I did, when I started with the Boondist movement with Donna Newman, I didn't do it for anybody except for Dr. Weisfeld. And now that he's becoming more of a household name, you know, I, I think that my real goals have been largely met. I do have some more work to do. I have some unfinished promises to keep, but I won't, I didn't want to be the speaker for this channel. I don't know if anybody knows that I didn't want to be the speaker for this channel. I was kind of put up here as the speaker for this channel. And some say I've improved, maybe I have, maybe I'm not, but you know, you'll notice how awkward I am in a lot of the videos from 2018 to 2019, up before the massacre, you know, and how I tried to keep this together in 2020 and it, I, I mean, I, I kept, I kept it glued I, as best I could, but, um, there was, there was other problems going on, and I'm one person, and, you know, I only can give you out so much scope, you know. I am happy and welcoming to all new Bundists that have gotten involved. Um, my own unit still exists, but it's back down to the two people, me and the other person with it. Uh, I had 11 more people with it that making, that making us, you know, um, uh, 13 members in all for a while. And those 11 members later left due to some sabotage from an individual called Dovid Maveritz. And perhaps more information can be given about him, but not at this time. But this next video is with Dr. Weisfeld and Steve Struggle. Here now, here we are. Okay. So I hear... Uh that the uh, the war in Ukraine is a disaster and that uh, we have no stake in this war, neither do the Ukrainians anymore. So what's to be done? Well, I find I'm, I'm, you know, I have, I've really been limiting my tongue on the war for a while and I'm not going to say everything I think right now, Abraham, but I would say this, if you are getting arms from somebody else and you are dying and getting, getting your ass kicked mm. and you are carrying out atrocities yourself, the war is just, the war is just lowering your own, your own moral standards. At this, at this point, first of all, first of all, if this were really a war, Ukraine wouldn't exist. Hmm. Russia could destroy Ukraine. They could, they could, they could do it very easily. They would find this war one hand behind their back. They don't want to have a lot of 
collateral damage. They've done a pretty good job of not doing that, I think. Um, they have to maintain some kind of international posture. See, they're they're different than the United States. The United States is a banded country. It's a country based on lying, stealing, mass murder, profiteering, racism. Okay, there's nothing the United States, there's no treaty the United States has ever signed that was worth the ink that it was signed with. And that starts from the native people. Huh. So therefore, the United States, and this is a hard statement to say, the validity of any United States participation in any war has to be questioned. Because your history follows you. And there's been no Truth and Reconciliation Commission or change in the U.S. position since its, since its inception. Instead of being a dog, a country of dogs, led 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 by dogs, vampires, mm. and other kind of other kind of predator animals. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's my view. So to me, when Zelensky comes here begging for some arms, there have not been demonstrations against him. That is disgraceful. Mm. The man is a racist to his heart. He's a, he, he's a chauvinist to his heart. He has all this anti-Russian propaganda used by the by the Ukrainian uh, um, nationalists of World War II era to uh, motivate his fight for power. That's all it's about for me, a fight for power for him. Mm-hmm. All the money he's getting, all the guns he's getting are simply, are really, the guns are really being used by the U.S. armed industry to prove how well their weapons work, mm. because when they have war, when they have war um, arms sales conventions in the Mid East or Europe, they'll use these. The, the war that all arms manufacturers use war to test their test their goods to sell to other countries. Okay, but who was Zelensky to come in to demand anything? I mean. I mean you're demanding something. And I think somebody tried to shut him up. I think he actually was, um, Republicans kind of censured him a little bit coming to the United States this time. He had, he, he, he met with a joint House of Congress last year, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. They, gave him some, they gave him some missiles they said they weren't going to give him. Mm. But right, yeah, they did. They, they, they weren't going to give these, these attack missiles mm. and they changed it. But I'm just going to say this. If I were, I'm not a Russian military leader. I'm not a Russian politician. But maybe they need to take the gloves off and end this war quickly. Because the longer it runs out, Ukraine's not going to win the war. They don't have enough, they don't have enough soldiers. They can't, they can't even recruit enough soldiers. Russia has 300,000 half a million soldiers in reserve being trained. I mean, the United States still has its money. They still took the people of Russia's money. They seized their they seized their money in banks. Mm. So if the war should teach you anything. Is if you get, if you even think that you're gonna throw, throw down with the United States in some way, secure your money. Mm. If you can, if you cannot, they'll seize your money. Now, I don't know what these boys in Iran was doing before, I think four U.S. spies were released a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they got billions of dollars the U.S. gave them, so they were really, must have been very valuable. Mm. They had to have been. Mm. Because the United States doesn't give up money too easily that they steal from other countries. They always keep it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right? They keep the money. Yeah. So all I'm saying is, if, you, if you're going to have a fight with the U.S., Seize your money and and make sure you destroy their proxy as soon as possible. Don't mind. I must say it wipe out civilians. No, 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 no. But do whatever you can to end it quickly. Mm. But the longer you fight, they'll get more weapons to, to have more long range, long range um targets. Who is to say 
they want to attack your your aerospace industry headquarters. Who is the city won't do it? Who I mean, I'm just saying. The longer you hang around with them, the bolder they get. Even though they're losing, they can't win the man-to-man war. Mm -hmm. The the offensive is a failure. But don't let them get any victories. Sometimes you just have to either win a war of attrition, which I think is what they're doing. Whatever they got to do. Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, if you stand up and say down with the war, if they kill all of you, they can't fight. They can't kill all of you. They, they got to have somebody to fight. At this point, there's so, so many people in the graves. So many people have been injured. So many sons, fathers, uncles, cousins, friends are dead. What I hear is that as soon as we're later, the soldiers, the soldiers are going to start start the mutiny. That's what I am hearing. Mm. It just continues. Mm. So if I'm concerned, you should go hurry, hurry up and mutiny and get, get, you know get over with. Mm. And maybe and maybe the Russians should start promoting that in in their in their propaganda to mm. Ukrainian soldiers. Yeah, it's time to quit. Yeah, that might be their best bet. If they can't, if they if whatever reason they don't want to take it to them. Militarily, maybe some soft power and some propaganda, or a combination of both, because they have the upper hand. Is that they have not mistreated Ukrainian soldiers. When Russia take them captive, they do not retreat, mistreat them. Ukraine mistreat them all the. the Ukraine mistreat Russian soldiers all the time. There's a there's a uh, picture on the internet maybe a month ago, maybe not even a month ago, of a Russian soldier. He was surrounded. He wanted to surrender. He took off his helmet, put down his weapons, put down a bulletproof vest, and assumed the position. And the Ukrainians just killed him. Just mm -hmm. wiped him off. So there are tons of videos out there which show Ukrainians committed mass murder, where there are no videos of Russians doing that. So the Russians have the upper hand as far as telling people to surrender. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that I hope whatever the combination they do, this whole thing needs to end. For the United States, Zelensky will not negotiate. So they they make it rid of him too. You never know. Mm. By one way by one way or another. Yeah. Plain plane wreck, poisoning, um, divorce, messy divorce. Well, you know, but the United States I do think wants to end the war before get it out of, get it out of the media because the elections are coming up. It's not an election issue. Republicans are kicking their ass. They're not winning the war. They're not winning. Mm. Biden looks like shit in public. Mm. So they got to get rid of the war. Mm. So in the, do, do what you can to bring it to a close, Russia, in the sense of use your soft power and hard power to convince the Ukrainian masses it's in their interest to stop fighting. If they don't fight, they can't, they can't kill them all. They can't. No, they can't kill all the soldiers. The Ukrainian army cannot kill all the, its own soldiers. <laughs> Even if they put them all up a firing squad, that will cause a mass uprising in Ukraine because not going to see the husbands and husbands and sons murdered because they 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 refuse to fight. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of people have been replaced in the, in the military. Even the American transgender woman who was such a vicious hawk, mm -hmm. she's 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 gone too. Mm -hmm. Something's going on. Mm -hmm. Something's going on in Ukraine. And we'll just see how long this is going to continue. Um, on an another front, uh, it seems that Armenia and uh, of the apparent col color revolution that occurred there a few years ago has now capitulated to uh, Azerbaijan and the Armenian enclave of uh, no, no, Nagorno Karabakh is going to be surrendered to to uh, uh, Azerbaijan, mm. and we'll see if the overtures toward the West by the Armenian government will uh, continue. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but one day we'll talk about my views on that part of the world too. I, I, I have a few things to say about something that's going on there that people might might be surprised that I even know about. But that's it for me right now. Uh -huh.
Yeah, you touched on uh, one of the aspects which is uh, never discussed in the media, and that is the accounting, you know, of this Ukraine war. But it's from the bits of information that I have gleaned, it seems like the um, gold reserves of Russia uh, placed in the various Western banks has been confiscated, looted, and it's being used basically, you know, to finance this war. Now, the United States is, uh, you know, uh, you know, spending all this money on arms and the money goes, you know, to the American arms uh, manufacturers, you know, the military industrial right. complex, right? right? Okay. But, you know, they put it on the tab, you know, the Ukraine, you know, the you know, United States is, you know, like, you know, has, has this, you know, scheme going, you know, which they're going to expect Ukraine to pay back the money that is being spent on the war. How? How do I pay it back? They ain't got no money. I saw this, you know, like I couldn't believe, you know, the United States is going to expect Ukraine, you know, to pay pay back all this money, you know, like how could they possibly do so? You know, like they'd have to sell off everything in the country, you know, like the whole country just be, you know, sold off in exchange, you know, for the national debt, you know, in this war. It's so pointless, well, you know, if they're going for independence, you know, like why are they doing this? You know, it must be well, for theological okay. reasons, you know, uh, because, you know, in terms of accounting and in terms of, you know, human lives of the Ukrainians themselves, you know, like this is not working. And yet they're going ahead with it. They're continuing on and on. So, I mean, well, Russia is sort of, you know, dropping a hint here and there, you know, that the Ukrainian soldiers, you know, should get rid of this mess themselves well, and take control of their own country. Well, that's, 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 a, very, that's a very good message because they, they aren't even having elections. Oh, it's too expensive to have an election right now. We're in war. Uh-huh. And now yeah. the United States didn't have elections because of, because of war. Man, that'd be it. What? No elections? We, oh, we have it in two years. Yeah, right. Okay. So the, po- the point is, you know, they. I mean, that's how much the dictatorship they're having now. They're even canceling. Russia just had an election a few months ago. A few weeks ago, they had their elect- local election. But Ukraine won't even have elections, and they outlaw the opposition. So... Yeah. Is is this is it's is is nothing but a sham, and you know really really it's really just a yeah. a shit show. Yeah. It's really just a shit show right now. Yeah, to me. Well, you know, Donbass had elections during the war. You know, since two thousand fourteen, they had they had elections. Two thousand fourteen, they had another uh, election. Uh, I think in uh, I can't remember. Yeah, twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, they've had elections, you know, and I mean, you, you, yeah, a real, you know, com- complete election should include all the refugees, you know, that have left, you know, for other parts, you know, in the meantime, right. I don't think Ukraine, you know, would uh, would be willing to do so, you know, they wouldn't, you know, let all the Ukrainian refugees, you know, in uh, Poland and in Germany and in Canada, you know, like, have a vote, you know, because they might not vote the right way, you know, like... <laughs> you, know, that's a, you know what? That's something that nobody has said, and you may have hit the nail on the head. You may have hit the nail right there on the head, that the refugee, the refugee vote may be what they are fearing the most. Because mm. the domestic vote will be cramped because the opposition has been, it has been made illegal. Yeah. But the refugee vote would not be illegal. They do yeah. anything they want. Yeah. Can't anybody looking over their shoulders? No, because they're another country. And if even, even, even if they have a spy network, it is not like the Savak in Iran during during the Shah. No, anything like that. No, uh-uh. no, no. That's a very good point. Someone we should, we should talk about that more. That actually might be what what they're scared of. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a very good point. Yeah. Huh. You know, Russia, what's Russia going to do? I mean, uh, you know, the only talk I've heard of, you know, a Russian offensive in the Donbass, you know, to uh, take uh, the rest of the territory that's missing from the Donetsk and Lugansk, you know, people's autonomous republics, <clears throat> that's supposed to be coming in in the springtime. But, you know, <laughs> Russian soldiers, you know, if they're trained to fight in the wintertime. You know, there's no reason why they couldn't do an offensive yeah, in the no. wintertime. While the Russians they are, they are, they are, like they are, they are trained. They are trained to fight in wintertime. They are trained to fight in wintertime. They are. Yeah. So we'll just see. We'll just see what what happens. Supposedly they're ready for the offensive, and I think that that the soft using soft and using military and soft power, they should get some results. 
Mm. And Ukrainian soldiers, the Ukrainian soldiers need this mutiny, lay down their arms, surrender, and that's it. Yeah. At this point, if they just refuse to fight, some of, now there may be somebody in the battalions that they'll have to neutralize who who who, who will shoot them in the back. Yeah. That unfortunately might happen. They may have to take some people out who are who are going to refuse to surrender. But in general, I think that is their best bet. Yeah, because if you're not fighting, the Russians will not kill you. Your Ukrainians might kill you trying to surrender, yeah. but the Russians at the they won't kill you. Yeah. Now the now Ukrainians may bomb the prisoner war camps. They they have done that. They have done that. But that's 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 the savagery that makes up the Ukrainian army. You're I'm right. Sorry. It could turn into a civil war in Ukraine. You know, if the uh, the uh, Nazi battalions don't want to stop fighting. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, they, they yes. Would have to be, they would have to be put down, you know. Like, you know, if they're going to start attacking yeah, right. other Ukrainians for for being anti-war, you know, then then the war is coming home. That's it. That's all. Well, that's that's something else we haven't talked about. But I do think that um, the possibility of Azov style, the Azov leaders waging a war against any government that would seek peace through the United States with Russia, there is a possibility that they would go to war. You're right. Mm. It is, it is a, it is a, so therefore, who would fight them? Mm. Somebody has to fight them because that that the government itself would then be under attack by the Azovs. And so they 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 would have to consolidate their loyal troops mm. think, you know, I mean, because if, if I'm sure, I, I can't say I'm sure, but you would, you would think that this would be part of the calculus of the new defense ministry. If, if we get a peace plan and if there's no unity among all the troops, what are we going to do? Because mm. some, some of my troops are kind of rabid. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, they're, they're rabid. So they may have to they may have to go to war with them. They may have to try and jail them. They they may have to they may have to neutralize them. Mm -hmm. yeah. They may have to neutralize them mm -hmm. militarily. They may have to just wipe them out. Yeah. Because if they want this deal, because what you just said is very important, Abraham. If the whole Ukrainian nation is on hock, it's time for a revolution in Ukraine. Yeah. Because you can't make us pay any money. We ain't going to pay you. Yeah. I don't care what we signed. That was the old government. I mean, it actually, this actually might be the time to talk about that. A real people, people's revolution in, in Ukraine. It's Look possible. what your things have done. It's yeah. possible because the whole nation is, it has been hot yeah. for its military aid. Yeah. Plus, there's the whole strategic defeat that they just uh, uh, are subjected to, you know, because Poland has cut off the... Uh, the uh, supply of I'm arms worried. that you know, were the were, how were the arms getting into uh, Ukraine? They were getting into the Ukraine by way of Poland. Okay, true, Poland has true. cut off you know any transfer of of weapons now. Plus, Whoa. yeah, plus they refuse to accept any importation of Ukrainian grain because it's you know being sold at a at a at a, at a loss you know to undercut you know the uh, Polish farmers, and the Polish government is going into election next month. So they have sure to are. show of you know nationalist fervor by saying that they're favoring you know the Polish farmer over the Ukrainian farmer now you know in terms of the sale of grain. <laughs> okay, so Ukraine is cut off from importations and the most important exportation now. You know, so you know this is time for Ukraine to reconsider you know their whole you know strategic approach because it's just been destroyed by Poland. Not, not even by Russia, you know, you know, Poland has done it. You know, their staunchest ally is now, you know, cut them off. They have no feet left. And I don't know where they're going to go, but it's not. Well, you know, that's usually, usually that's what weakens you the worst is when your ally stabs you in the back. Yeah. Not your friend, not your friend. I mean, not your enemy. You expect your enemy to stab you in the back. Mm-hmm. What what needs to happen, really, to be quite frank with you, is a secret delegation going to Russia, negotiating a peace, 
overthrowing Zelensky, establishing a neutral government. Hmm. That's probably their only hope. Yeah. They can, they can make amends with Russia. I mean, a different leadership. And it may be hard to find that leadership in Ukraine. It may come from the diaspora. <clears throat> hmm. The, uh, you know, the, um, uh, we are the, what are the, what do they call those governments? The government in exile. They base it in, you know, they base it in France or some shit. You know how, how they do this. Hmm. We're the government of exile of so and so land. And we are based in this mountain. And we we call for the Ukrainians. Da, 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 da. So, you know how they do that shit. They do it all the time. Hmm. You know, and that, I mean, there may be that approach. And that, that approach might happen too from people in, in the diaspora. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Because they are in Western countries yeah. and they are in Russia and they are in Russia. Yeah. Well, the Ukrainian fascist forces have uh, long been organized, you know, especially here in Canada, even subsidized by public yeah. funds, you know, for cultural pursuits, supposedly. But, mm. you know, although it's, you know, so difficult for Ukrainians to organize within Russia, within the Ukraine, you know, because of the repression there, uh, the uh, Ukrainian diaspora, you know, as you say, you know, is is free to do so. You know, they could organize, you know, their own revolutionary movements now. They are free to do. They are free. To, they have so much freedom to do so. Yeah. There's so much freedom to do so. Yeah. So they it's, organize it, themselves I mean, and they, you know, <laughs> collect support, you know, for their for their allies within Ukraine. And then they come back to the Ukraine all organized. Well, then they can just take over the country. Yeah. They can take, they can take over. Yeah. They, they can take over. And actually, unfortunately, or fortunately, because they're in the West, they can play dual, dual revolutionary, dual revolutionary tactics, making the West think that they really want to have a pro-Western government. But we know we got to do something here. So why, why, <laughs> <you, so, laughs> i.e., 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 Fidel Castro. We want to, we want friends with the West. We got to get rid of dictatorship. Why do you help us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the thing I do look at history. Yeah. Read the history, but oh, we play this line. You have to work right, you know. And bring a few scientists, some technocrats, you know, and shake hands behind the scenes with and tell Victoria Newland and Big Chicks open and go the fuck to hell. T talk to somebody else and just, you know, we can freeze yeah. the conflict. You, yeah. you, you can take take arm, all the arms you want for the United States. Just don't use them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah, if they, well, even if they do start something, you know, of an opposition in the in the diaspora, and, and even if it's you know starts off as being pro-Western, you know, once they start something, you know, the people on the ground, you know, are not going to sort of you know, just you know, listen to every word, you know, they're just going, they're going to pick it up, you know, they can go with, go with it, you know, on their own, on their own basis, you know, they're not going to sort of you know, you know, allow uh, a U.S. military base to be installed in Ukraine, you know, like. <laughs> And I, I bet you that's one of the plans they have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It has to be a plan they have. Yeah. You know, it it's intimidation. They want to surround the USSR, surround the China, uh, and uh, make it, <clears throat> you know, the military balance of forces, you know, such that they can dictate to Russia and China what to do, you know. Because otherwise, you know, the consequences would be too severe. That's you know the strategy. They don't, you know, I don't think the United States wants an overt war. It's like a shadow war that they're waging on both Russia and China. Um, I mean, what they better hope is they never get a government in Mexico or you know Panama or Puerto Rico Cuba or anybody that'll say, hey, you know what? We want independence. We're, we're just taking independence. Yeah. The part of independence, we'll get the arms from China and now we're gonna set a battery right here. You can over here, we'll just fuck you up. Yeah. If that ever was to happen, that would change. Would, oh my, what are we gonna do now? They have to either destroy Puerto Rico, destroy you know, they have to do something just outlandish. They couldn't cut off their, their electricity. And I'm, hopefully they've seized their own money, put their money in the in the BRICS bank in Brazil. So they can't get the BRICS bank money. Yeah. Oh yeah. Put your money. I keep telling you, put your money somewhere else. Yeah. But, you know, as far as the United States is concerned in all this, you know, they're spending so much money. And, you know, like, 
and it's causing inflationary crisis and uh Man, I mean, it's it, called it, the civil it, all sorts crisis. of consequences yeah. to this you know but but you know how does the united states think they can get away with this you know like financially so it they struck don't. me yeah. when i heard that the united states has nine thousand tons of gold stashed away okay so that's okay. you know so there's a 333 trillion dollar debt of the united states yeah to the uh i don't know to to the fed you know or whatever you know but the reason why it's not being called in is because the United States does have this collateral. That's why the United States hasn't collapsed under this debt load. But uh, but that's what's keeping it going so far. Uh, but whether or not the the uh, the inflationary uh, cost is going to kill the economy. That's the question. Well, I, I think that, let me tell you what's going on here, too. You know, they have this UAW, the, the, the United Auto Workers are on strike. And I think right now in your country, the Unifor is in the process of selling out the, you know, uh, the uh, a fourth. Um, uh, but, but, as they, okay. There's a fake solution to emissions by creating electronic vehicles. Mm -hmm. That's a move for profitability of a new type of, of a new type of product to sell. And Tesla right now is leading that market, or at least in the United States, Tesla and some companies in China. Yeah. But all the people they'll have to lay off because the production of the car is different than that of the in internal combustion engine. Mm. With the creation of this electronic vehicle market, it's gonna create mass unemployment. Yeah. Yeah, and that's gonna to have the domino effect, you know, because if all the auto workers are not out there spending money, then, you know, the companies cannot sell, you know, what they're making. And so they're gonna close and then those, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that I'm saying that to say two things. One, we should not believe that the intent of the electronic vehicle is the end pollution. Oh, it's being made in China yeah. in any case, you know. And, and the Chinese electric car companies, you know, are more advanced than Tesla now and less expensive as well. So, you know, like the whole and right. also the automotive uh, industry in Germany is going downhill too. Yeah, oh, and well, all Germany, of these vehicles oh. are, you know, you know, yeah. they're supposed to be, you know, banned by 1935. You know, so you you can't buy a vehicle now that you expect to last more than 10 years. You know, you know, so people usually buy a vehicle, you know, with the resale value in mind. You know, thinking they're going to get their money back. They won't get their money back because the vehicle cannot be sold. Well, you know? That's it. I, 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 you know, you made you made a very good point here, and I guess I'm a little bit. I I consider myself maybe reactionary. On reactionary on this point but why is it that people who have cars and what i'm saying is if the if the evs will have a detrimental impact on employment which is going to have why and this is going to sound very reactionary why shouldn't there be a movement against evs or against law against laws that say they'd be outlawed. Because why do I have to buy another car? I mean, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 not saying I'm against I'm for I'm, I'm for pollution. Don't don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's because you want me to buy another car. Because you want because you want to make some money. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that okay, I I'm I'm I think that's some. I probably need, need need to think through better. Yeah. But I don't, I don't intend to buy another car just because you told me to buy one. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I intend to have a car to drive. If, I, if I'm in a, if I'm in a place where I have to have a car, then I need to have a car. I don't live in a community where we can walk everywhere. If that's the case. I wouldn't would need a car. Yeah. So they're making us. They're making us use driverless cars. They're making us use electronic vehicles. 
driverless cars don't have a driver, okay? Electronic vehicles have electronic vehicles have less people in in, in a production plant. So I do think that people in these in industrialized countries or activists in industrialized countries need to really consider what what is the plan here? Like you said, what's the plan? Mm-hmm. Because people won't have the money to buy electric vehicles. Yeah, yeah. a laid off auto worker is not going to buy an electric car, no way. Yeah. But, you know, electric car itself, you know, like is, is, is totally out of it, you know, because it's a waste of resources. And, uh, you know, could, and, you know, the better transportation system, of course, would be free public transit, free tra- public tra- uh, transit. Here, here we call it uh, transpo. Yeah, free public transit, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, with with uh, the minibuses going down side streets as well, like they have in Europe. Uh, you know, all right. you know, complete. You know, like a public transit system. You know, that's for free. Then we wouldn't need any cars anymore. You know, like so. Uh, you know that in order to for the bulk of the people to survive, you know, economically, that's what's going to uh, take. You know, free public transit. You know, not a car, not an electric car. Uh, and, and to right. produce, you know, right. electric car takes, you know, so much, you know, so much in terms of, you know, energy in the first place, you know, that it it defeats its own purpose, you know, because if you're trying to avoid, you know, using, you know, uh, uh, um, carbon carbon uh, fuel, uh, well, you know, like it, it's still being used in order to make, you know, the the thing you know produced in the first place, and in China they're even using you know brown coal for energy source because you know they're maintaining the accelerated you know industrialization process there, which is so self defeating. You know, Peking, Beijing, you know, is uh, under smog. You know, so much of the year, you know, people are are suffering as a result. You know, of this um, needless uh, you know capitalist industrialization that China's into. It's it's. Uh, you know, like they're very proud of themselves for doing so, you know, but, you know, like it's it's uh, still self-defeating as far as the population is concerned. So, you know, like, uh, but, you know, they're so incapable, even the Social Democrats, you know, are incapable of coming up with any sort of, you know, significant reforms. You know, the New Democratic Party here in Canada, you don't hear anything from them about, you know, climate crisis. Nothing about, you know, like, uh, yeah, public transport system, nothing at all. When I was a candidate for the Green Party here, you know, I, I ran on a free, pl- free public transport. And it's, uh, you know, like, you know, people say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea, you know, but, you know, people didn't hook into it, you know, they t- sort of didn't realize, you know, this is not just, you know, a good idea. It's something that they have to have. You know, there's got to be this element of compulsion. And the crisis hasn't hit hard enough yet for people to realize that they have to, that they're under compulsion to change everything. That feeling has not yet arose, arisen, and, and it will arise. It will but, arise. That's true. Yeah. And uh, I think you know this, the uh, inflationary cycle is going to do it. You know, like right now, the labor movement is going to have to move. You know, in, in, into fighting for you know, what's called the COLA clause, uh, cost of living allowance. There has to be a COLA clause in every union contract. If not, then, you know, all these workers are going to be working for nothing because all of their wages, you know, are going to be worth nothing, you know, with inflation. So, you know, they have to have a COLA clause. And, you know, this is going to uh, 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 decline you know, the level of profitability of all the American corporations. Uh, and uh, they probably would not survive, you know, a COLA clause. So, you know, we're moving towards, you know, some kind of a, you know, like uh, end point. You know, it's difficult to say, you know, what's going to be happening exactly, but, you know, there has to be an end point to this. You know, it cannot go on and on, you know, like what is it the United States has has served up, you know, in the Ukraine war so far? Uh, 60, 75 billion dollars. Canada's just, you know, offered another half a billion dollars. In Europe, you know, I think also did, you know, something like a hundred billion dollars, you know, like who's going to pay for this ultimately, you know, working people are not going to want to pay for this war. 
especially after it's lost, <laughs> you know, like paying for a lost war. Well, that's the worst thing possible. You know, like, you know, if they, if, you know, paying, paying for, you know, a winning war that can be sold, you know, but paying for a losing war, no, that can't be sold. You're right above that. Yeah. So okay. We don't have that? much time yet. So, uh, oh. good to speak with you again this week, Steve, you know, and, uh, I'll see you again next week, and uh, we'll take this whole system apart, piece by piece. So this uh, video should conclude now with uh, something from the Mark Spencer Show. The Mark Spencer Show is featured on the Real News Network. This presentation came out on September 26, 2023. I uh, hope all viewers enjoy this. It is particularly relevant to the current situation that we find ourselves in today. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's good to have you with us. And welcome to another edition of Not In Our Name. Rebecca Ruth Gold is our guest today. She's written a profoundly important book called Erasing Palestine, Free Speech and Palestinian Freedom. This work weaves a deeply analytical tale of the contradictions and complexities of anti-Semitism intertwined with anti-Semitism at the root of Zionism, how the struggle against anti-Semitism was hijacked by xenophobia and Islamophobia, how the battles surrounding free speech in our world complicate an already complex reality. And through it all, she also talks about how great Marxist activists and thinkers like Isaac Deutscher and Leon Abram may offer a path of understanding that anti-Semitism's demise is wrapped up in Palestinian liberation. And Ruth Gold is also the author of numerous other books. So let me tell you what some of them are. They are Writers and Rebels, The Persian Prison Poem, Prison Hunger Strikes in Palestine, and she's written for numerous uh, publications, London Review of Books, Globe and Mail, and many others, and her work has been translated into 11 languages, which is really impressive. So um, uh, I want to I thank you for joining us today. This is, uh, I, I really really good to have you here it's a great pleasure to be here thanks for inviting me and i want to open with um your poem the piece of it you wrote because i want to talk about how this all began with your sojourn to israel and palestine and what brought you there and what you discovered your root mm -hmm. your root awakening of sorts when, mm -hmm. you, when you got there and this poem you have on on page two workers greet the dawn behind the bars of checkpoint 300 waiting to build settlers homes with stolen limestone. So talk a bit about your soldier and how, how this book actually began because of the of this of, of going to Israel Palestine to live and work. Sure. So I had just this was 2011 and I had just received my PhD. I was actually living in Berlin at the time and sort of not knowing what the future held. Um, <laughs> I did have a degree in um, in Middle Eastern studies, but that was mostly to do with Iran, so I'd never been to um, never been to uh, Israel or Palestine. I very much wanted to go. And I had a, a I, I was uh, offered a fellowship at an Israeli uh, research institute called the Bernler Institute uh, that is sort of on the very much, uh, you know, to the extent that there is a left at all within Israel, it's, it's, it's as far as one can get and survive. Um, and so they do do some good work. They have Palestinian academics, for example, hmm. uh, but you know, every institution has its limits. Anyway, I accepted the offer after, after kind of a little bit of internal struggle, but I just, I just so desperately wanted to have the opportunity to, to, to live there, particularly to live in Palestine, even though of course the, the um, Institute was in Jerusalem. So what happened was I found a place to live in Bethlehem and um, then I just commuted uh, to through the checkpoint, that checkpoint 300 that I mentioned that does kind of very loom very large in my imagination and my memory. And I think in the uh, uh, lives of countless Palestinians as well, it's this sort of industrial warehouse where people wait for, as I wrote, I mean, for, for just like five or six hours, uh, the lines aren't moving. Uh, anyway, so that was like the, the texture of my life. I was right by the wall. And I was really, you know, I, um, the time I had spent there made it definitely made a big impact. But, but the, the most, the thing that stood out most was just this sense of like two totally separate worlds that are right next to each other, right? Because Bethlehem is literally just a walk, a very short walk from Jerusalem, but it's about four, it could be four hours um, just waiting in line, the commutes. And uh, half of that time is, you know, you're standing like near these loaded guns being, um, 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) facing so it's very sort of toward traumatic journey and it was just so strange because yeah these worlds are next to each other they're they're woven together historically there's have so much in common and yet you know israelis don't cross the line they don't they never go to the west bank in fact they're technically forbidden um and and most palestinians cannot leave either so yeah so that's that's kind of i mean that it's kind of like visual um embodiment of the idea of apartheid but not not you know that's just in a legal sense but just every every aspect of life and yeah, I think that was that was a bit overwhelming. I mean, you, you you get the sense from how you wrote in the beginning of the book that it was um, even though you 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 were not a naive human being walking into where you were going, it was mm-hmm. shocking nevertheless. The depth yeah. of it seemed to shock you a great deal. Exactly. I just because it's the kind of thing that I personally couldn't live more than you know certainly more than a year in that. I mean, it is just that uh, total schizophrenia. Yeah. So I mean, I knew I knew like the general sense of the politics and so forth, but just the daily schizophrenia of it was was not i was not quite prepared for that so i w- one of the things that um I, I love in the beginning you have this 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 great quote and i think you you spend a lot of time throughout the book and we'll and we'll weave in and out of this talking about isaac deutscher and a couple of other people um and um and i was it, you you made me kind of go back and kind of look at all my old deutscher notes as i was awesome <laughs> I like, love that. I love plugs for Deutscher. He's kind of forgotten these days, so that's happening. Happy he has that. been forgotten in many ways, but I, I remember seeing him at the Socialist Scholars Conference. I forget it was either in '66 wow. or '67 in New York. Um, Amazing. Yeah, and and hmm. listening to him uh, there, but and, and reading all of his books. But he wrote this, which I think is really profound, and it's a good way to start this off. He says, mm-hmm. and, and you, you you quote him saying, "It's a tragic and macabre truth." the greatest redefiner of the Jewish identity has been Hitler. Mm-hmm. Auschwitz was the terrible cradle of the new Jewish consciousness and the new Jewish nation. And, and from his essay, Who is a Jew? Which I thought was a profoundly important essay. Um, yes. Uh, and so, I mean, so one of the things that strikes me about your book, and this is kind of overarching to start with, is that contradiction. It's these mm-hmm. contradictions of how anti-Semitism in many ways, was at the was at the root of the founding of Israel, and how yes, that it pushed absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and and uh, so talk a bit about that and, and the kind of your discovery around that. Sure, and I think I could also sort of tell the end of the story of yeah, the, what the introduction introduces, why I wrote the book, because I, I wrote an article called you right. know, uh, Beyond Anti-Semitism that that got me in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, well, it's 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 just simply as you said, Israel was founded. Because of anti-Semitism at a at a sort of uh, industrial scale, um, and and that's a trauma that I think is is very much alive. I mean, it, it's it, it shapes very Israeli sort of life. I mean, based on you know, I'm thinking of my conversations at the Berlin Van Leer Institute, having dinners with people, and just how they would kind of process the legacy of that history. I think a lot of it, the Israelis I spoke with, at least, uh, were aware who was sort of. A little bit maybe on the left, critical of their society and so forth. But they themselves said that you know the state was was using that trauma um, in a way to kind of silence the discussion about the occupation. Um, and uh, actually, there's a really wonderful. I really want to make a plug for um, Amos Goldberg, who's a professor at Hebrew University, a professor of Holocaust studies. Actually, he's shed so much light on this question. He has a very uh, provocative and perhaps to some very controversial, but very eye-opening article about the uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And I, yeah, and the way in which that, the, the memory is kind of packaged and, uh, and, and it's the traumas, I mean, yeah, it's still, it's still, um, I guess, suppose not fully, not fully processed. And I think a lot of these, a lot of these um, controversies that we're having around defining anti-Semitism yeah, has to do with that. So I, one of the things that I thought about as I was reading the book, and especially when I f- finished it, was that and you touched on this throughout the book, but I'm very curious to probe it a bit more, which is, which is your own journey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your, your journey from being, I mean, when you, when you read your name, it sounds like a Jewish name, Rebecca Gould, uh-huh. sure. <laughs> you know, and, 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 but, but your family's kind of losing who they were as Jews over a couple of generations. And, and, and you're kind of rediscovering that through the eyes of Jewish Marxists and your time in Israel and, and exploring this world. So it's, it's, sure. talk a bit about that. Cause I think that really, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's not traumatic, but it, I mean, but it begins it was to, transformational. Yeah. Perhaps transformational uh-huh. is the word. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would say that I, 
in a sense, I kind of always knew these details of my family history, but I had not really reflected on them in a in a kind of in depth way because I certainly wasn't raised Jewish. But you were raised Catholic, was, right? Uh, well, secular, yes. Se- secular gotcha, Catholic. gotcha. Yes, yeah, right. Yes, exactly. right. Historic, I understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it did come as quite a shock to be accused of anti-Semitism. I mean, it's, it's I think that accusation has become very banal and kind of pro-Palestinian circles because it's often misused and abused and so forth. But, you know, I just never thought that when I was writing the Beyond Anti-Semitism, it was like the furthest thing, you know what I mean? There, I was, I was just kind of um, filtering what the, what Israelis were telling me, what was being said on Israeli media, a left wing and so forth. And so it was, it, it was like, I, I just had to process that because even if I, I obviously did not consider myself anti-Semitic, but I was the the very thought, you know, that that I, I something I said could have been hurtful was was a shock to me. It was just like, oh my God, where, how is this, how how could that possibly have happened? And I think that that took me back into a journey of just like thinking about, you know, who am I, what am I, um, a very kind of yeah personal introspective journey. At, at some point, it did become a kind of political struggle for free speech, and that's also very important. But but the first reaction was just. Um, amazement you know, that, that that it could have been offensive uh, to well, it, it was offensive to British Jews, you know, who hadn't been to Israel, hadn't been to Palestine, and so I think that that's important to say. But but yeah, so that that's that that and it was great. It was fascinating to rediscover um, the the Jewish sides of my family. Um, actually, this happened from the, I, I was while I was writing this book, my father passed away too. And it's my father's side of the family that that is of Jewish heritage. And so I, there's actually I have to say there. A lot of questions that came up that I I did, wasn't able to ask him, but I, at least I was able to dedicate the book to him. So yeah, so it definitely is a highly uh, highly personal subject, and it has been a way of of yeah. My my, my family migrated, you know, from po- deep poverty in um, in Ludge in in Poland, and they found a new life for themselves in America. But once they got to America. Um, yeah, they they changed their name. It was Goldstein. Uh, I guess they they thought it didn't sound very Jewish, but maybe it does to, to, to many. <laughs> and and yeah, I think they just did everything they could to assimilate um, and erase that that history. And then you, as you just alluded to a moment ago, that you wrote about in the book, were accused of being of making anti-Semitic attacks in the work that you published. Yes, and it, so I, it's it's worth saying, right? So the the work that I published in 2011 when I was living in uh, Bethlehem. In fact, I remember when I wrote it, I'd just come back from Hebron, which is where some of the settler, uh, the settler movement has in a sense been the most extreme. I mean, they just, they, they're, the, many Palestinians live in fear of their lives. And I was witnessing that. I was actually with a, a colleague from the Van Leer Institute and we were sort of in a bus. I mean, we actually did go outside, but just again, this sort of dual world uh, phenomenon was really overwhelming to me. And, and yeah. And, and so I wrote that article. I, I just think it's important to, to, to recognize like that's the context I wrote it in, in the middle of that conflict. Right. And then I got to the university of Bristol five years later uh, and a student who describes himself as a uh, Israeli British uh, and a Zionist um, uh, came across the article. I never actually spoke to the student um, one-on-one. I still haven't. I mean, there was never a one-on-one co- conversation between us, but he, I guess, Googled my name and found that article and then, uh, yeah, published a op-ed uh, saying it was anti-Semitic um, and uh, it needed, yeah, to be sort of investigated and and that, and there was a sort of slow trail of media controversy um, that, that that had a big impact. Um, I think it, it is, the, the important thing to say about that is you know, that's not just a personal story. Uh, this had never happened before in the UK in a sense, because compared to the compared to the US, I actually went to Columbia University where Edward Said was a professor and there were cases of like tenure controversies around Palestinian activists and so forth. The UK didn't have that history. Uh, but what it did have is that in 20, the end of 2016, just a few months before this, this um, attack on me was, my article was published. Uh, it had adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. It was the first government to do that in the world. And so that marked a kind of governmental interest in the criticism or in preventing criticism of Israel, which I think explains a lot about why this particularly, you know, short article of not much consequence, to be honest, um, it got a lot of notoriety very quickly. So how much did that experience, Mm -hmm. obviously that experience in you going there and also kind of reclaiming where some of your ancestry came from, influenced you to write this book in the first place? 
Uh, well, I, I think as soon as it was happening to me, I realized at some point, you know, I was going to need to, 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 to write it, to, to write it down because it was, it was just so far again, this kind of experience of surrealism. I didn't believe that, that by coming to the UK, which is a country, you know, doesn't have a first amendment, but it's a country that's right. That is thought of as being liberal democratic, protecting free speech. It has a concept of academic freedom. I just didn't think that an article I wrote five years earlier in you know, very different would matter. Um, but it did a lot. <laughs> I mean, in fact, the the uh, ho- very prominent politician uh, called me a Holocaust denier and he said I should be fired. Uh, he said that in one of the mainstream conservative newspapers. And so, yeah, that um, and, and, and what was also interesting was that I, I got the sense that, you know, the university ultimately they they when it reviewed the article, they said it was it was not anti-Semitic and so forth. So it, what was interesting was that there was a very sharp contrast between like everyone around me sort of knew it it wasn't really anti-Semitic, including the university, I think from the beginning. But governmental pressure, governmental intrusion on this question was so intense that they were just acting at the basically the behest of the government. Um, yeah, so that so the free speech, I mean, that it, it, in addition to making me, you know, much more interested in my Jewish roots, it also just really awakened me into that free speech is actually something I, it, it's not just like this, this uh, value that, you know, right wing politicians talk about. It's actually something that I yeah. personally need kind of to survive as a person because I'm, I'm being, you know, uh, libeled for things I never said. And, and I can't, I'm not being and, and at that particular moment, I wasn't able to speak out because I had to kind of, you know, not cause controversy. The university even though, even though, again, like everyone kind of internally kind of reassured me this is not problematic, but they said, don't say anything, you know, be quiet, shut up. We're going to our media team is going to figure this out. And there are bigger <laughs> issues, right? So that that sense of being suppressed, having your voice silenced and not just my voice. I mean, what was interesting is I felt that what they did do this kind of detailed review of the article, which was really I mean, it was wrong, I think, kind of from a kind of ethical perspective, because, again, I wrote this five years ago, so it shouldn't have been relevant, but they did it. And they used the IHRA definition, like point by point, to figure out whether it was anti-Semitic. But most importantly, they said that it was written from the United States. You know, they didn't ask me. I mean, they just totally got that wrong. So they erased the Palestinian and the Israeli context completely. They even, you know, they misread right. it. And this, this was a, I, this, this was just like a casual thing. This was like a formal inquiry. You know, that was that was pr- that was supposed to be done at a very high level of of uh, professionalism with with legal counsel involved and so forth. And it was it was just so biased, even though it found in my favor, it was still just incredibly biased, incredibly silencing. Um, and so that I think that experience of being silenced made me want to speak out, obviously. Um, yeah. And so that and then, and then seeing that happen to other people. Um, and again, actually, at the same time, this, this is again worth mentioning to make to bring home the point that it's not just my experience or my story. Um, again, it's worth saying that UK had been a place where Palestinian activism was was not suppressed until 2017. But at the same time that the student wrote wrote an article accusing my article of anti-Semitism and connecting it to the IHRA definition, the, the anti-Semitism charges, um, there was also a um, a campaign, really, that's it's a group, yeah, that that calls themselves a campaign against anti-Semitism, uh, had uh, uh, tar- targeted a student at the University of Exeter, which is nearby, calling her anti-Semitic because of her tweets from five years earlier. She was a student from Gaza, and uh, yeah, said so that this happened at the same time. Um, anyway, so there was a kind of it, something was organized, and and, and uh, there's just a lot of a lot of sense of articles being withdrawn from curriculum people being silenced and, and it became clear. And it was interesting to me that this kind of definition was, was being so useful. I mean, it was so useful in sense in censoring. And I'd never seen that happen before, you know, that particular kind of mechanism of censorship was totally new to me. And so it, it just opened my eyes to, I guess, the way bureaucracies work and the way governments work. Let's talk a bit about the, one of the things that's the, a couple of things struck me here in the book, a lot of things struck me in this book. It's really well written. It's a very in, it's a very intense read, which is the reality of anti-Semitism, the depth of anti-Semitism in this world that is just kind of in the DNA of of Western society mm-hmm. that you write about, um, and how you see that kind of pain turning into oppression. You you have these great quotes by Isaac Deutscher all over the place. And I, 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 I'm a fan of Isaac Deutscher, so I, I, really, I really enjoyed you kind of pulling him into this. As am I. 
right? Yeah, because that when I was when I was young, when I was fifteen, I was a teenage trot. That's where I got introduced to Isaac Deutscher. So, uh-huh. <laughs> but wonderful. At, at, at any rate, he said, "When you we have the quote, religion, I am an atheist. Jewish nationalism, I'm an internationalist." In neither mm-hmm. sense am I therefore a Jew. I am, however, a Jew by force of my unconditional solidarity with the persecuted and the exterminated. I'm a Jew. I feel the pulse of Jewish history because I should like to do all I can to assure that the real, not spurious security and self-respect of the Jews. So this, so this, this, mm-hmm. this is part of your journey as well. Right. And when you kind of look at both the depth of anti-Semitism, how that created what became Israel, how that created this oppression of Palestinians, and and so and you and you weave this tale around that before we get to free speech, which we'll get to in a mm-hmm. minute. Sure, sure, of course, right? Yeah, and I, I think it's worth pointing out. So Isaac Deutscher is also a very big inspiration to me, but it's also interesting that you know he speaks for a generation. I think a generation of a certain kind of uh, certainly geographic space. I'm thinking of you know Polish Jews from the sh- or, or, or Jews of the former yeah, Russian Empire right, from the shadow. Right, right. It is just astonishing how many of them, you know, turned towards radical leftism. Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, these are anarchists who migrated to America. I think they 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 may they didn't talk so much about being Jewish, but I you know it, it doesn't seem like a coincidence. There was a, a definitely a kind of demographic phenomena of and let me Jews. just say and Leon yeah. Abram, who I never heard of until I read your book. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I love him. I mean, I, I wasn't very familiar with this work either, and it's not, it hasn't been given a lot of visibility. So I think, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is a similar demographic. I mean, they were all born, I think everyone, yeah, the, all of these people I just mentioned, either Poland or the former Russian Empire, and they, so they experienced this, this is like forced segregation, limited economic opportunities. It was, and, and that pushed them, and they all became very, on the left, you know, they, they saw themselves as their, their struggle as one that had to do with workers across internationally, anti-colonialism, Rosa Luxemburg, it would be another. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think he speaks for a very, a very broad sector of a certain, a certain world that is not, um, a lot of that was annihilated by the Holocaust to some extent, um, not entirely, but yeah. Um, so that it, yeah. Um, and, and I, 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 I'm, uh, any chance I can get to talk about, um, and so I think his, that's actually a name that he assumed, um, Abram Leon. I often, for some reason, I mix up the name, the, the order of names as well, but yes, this is a wonderful author of a book that is called in English, um, the Jewish question. Um, it, he wrote in French under in Nazi occupied Belgium, and I'm just astonished. So he had obviously li- very limited access to scholarship or scholarly resources, but he he uh, you know, working under incredibly difficult constraints. Uh, but he he produces this kind of scholarly masterpiece about the history of anti-Semitism, incorporating it's kind of he's it, inspired by Max Weber, so he uses a very so soci- looks at it through a very sociological lens. But he also talks about colonialism. He connects. Uh, the 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 exploitation of the Jews throughout history to the way the colonies were were are exploited. I think that's that's pretty astonishing. I mean, he was writing in the forties, uh, and yeah, yeah. So, so that th- that that's a tradition that that uh, we really need to re- explore and and keep alive and be aware of at least in the present. So, but then you you also kind of go into the 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 whole. I mean, the whole question of of free speech. Mm-hmm. Which I find, and, and into the complexity of that, mm-hmm. um, and, and it is complex, <laughs> right? And, and so, definitely complex. Yeah. Um, to, to defending everybody's right to, to, to free speech, at the same time talking about the silencing of speech mm-hmm. that's taking place, especially if it has to do with being with with, with Palestinian oppression. Mm-hmm. And talk a bit about yeah. So, so to, to, to talk a bit about that in terms of of what you discovered. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, some of my kind of shock about the whole thing that was happening to me is, as I mentioned already, this sense of being being silenced, even when most people I was in conversation with them talking about like university administrators and so forth, even when they didn't necessarily disagree with me, but I was still silenced. Right. So um, th- th- and I I I think. Uh, there's a part of me that I'm not generally sort of very American in most of my ways, uh, but I am of American. I was born in the United States. And I think there was this kind of unconscious First Amendment just 
orientation to me that that really was was really yeah amazed by by the way by the way in which it was seen as just being okay not to not to be allowed to express one's views and and, and that um so that so that yeah that 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 was kind of my personal uh, at the time, I was also reading, reading about uh, uh, in prisoners in Iran because that, that's the book area that I wrote a book on, and and, and there just seemed to be a, a kind of unexpected parallels between the the silencing that they were experiencing and and what I was experiencing. And I and I realized because I, I think I'd always thought of free speech as something that either either in, in the in the liberal democracies it's something that kind of the right wing only talks about, whereas in maybe places like Iran it's something that you know the left is concerned with. But but in my world, it's not really like a a big issue in my, like, I'm not, you know, I don't want to go out there preaching racism to anyone. So it's not something that I personally (laughs) have to, you know, struggle with. Like I'm okay with, with hideous views being silenced, but I think, and I think anti-Semitism is a really interesting case because, you know, I I obviously, I don't think my article was anti-Semitic. But if someone comes to me who was a Holocaust survivor, for example, and says, you know, Rebe- I, your this article that you wrote makes you makes me very uncomfortable. I think you're too critical of Israel. I guess there's a part of me, maybe I'm you know a little bit more. You use the word dialectical. I think that was a very interesting word, right? There's a part of me like I don't. I think it's important just to acknowledge what people feel, right? So, so I feel like that it's very difficult to argue about these these questions of anti-Semitism. There is so much difference of perception, right? With one person, because I, I do think there is an objective way of, you know, figuring out what's anti-Semitic and not. But I also think there's just a wide margin of emotions and traumas and everything else that goes into this question that we kind of do need to find a way of just respecting everyone's right to to feel what they feel and think what they think. Right. So if, say, you know, a Holocaust survivor, for example, um, is probably not going to be in danger walking down the streets of of London. Right. But perhaps they have this very, very traumatic memory somewhere back in their past that's made them afraid and i'm not going to be the person to say okay they're idiots let's just you know what i mean they don't have a right to feel what they feel so what, what i guess what i'm saying is I, I i feel that people but this is the case though because that, that still i'm not going to accept you know therefore that seeing a palestinian flag for them to see a palestinian flag in london is an example of anti-semitism i don't accept that but i do kind of want to respect where they're coming from and so in other words it means that i as, as someone who you know believes in in these different perspectives, the the legitimacy of them, I have to acknowledge things that contradict each other in society, right? And, and there are there are different perspectives, and I, I think the question of defining anti-Semitism is an area where you know there's never going to be a world in which everyone completely agrees. Which not we're not going to get there. Um, and and you know there are some things are black and white, right? Like when to do with hate crimes, but there are other much much grayer areas. Usually these are areas to do with speech and attitudes. And perceptions. And I think it's more important to just let people debate, let people voice their views, um, and rather than trying to outlaw them. And it's also very difficult. I mean, I mean, mm-hmm. one of the things in that chapter in your book that struck me was was the was the the difficulty to wrestle with are there limits? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and how you even begin to talk about that. I mean, right. to 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 protect everyone's right to say what has to be said. Mm-hmm. Even if you despise what they're saying, yes. Even yes. if they're right, I mean, and, and, and in this day and age, uh-huh. it's, it's hard on many levels because because to allow racist speech to take place in universities or anti-Semitic mm-hmm. speech to take place in universities is become a really controversial piece, Absolutely. left and right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right? There is there's a much people I think these days are much more in favor of of uh you know banning books or or um it's trying other ways of, of you know getting getting the the views that are problematic to kind of disappear uh but that hasn't worked you know in the past and i'm not sure <laughs> to the present um and yeah i i think it's you know, one can look at it from a kind of um just a practical perspective when has that worked usually it it, it the views are still there the people who are whose views are silenced tend to think that the fact that they're being censored makes them feel more righteous and more justified. Um, I think, I think personally, you know, anti-Semitic points of view often can be disproven. I mean, empirically, right? And racism is empirically incorrect. It it can be um, reason can not. I don't say completely, but to some extent, you know, it 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 can be uh, debated. Um, maybe not out of existence, but dramatically reduced just by, just by 
by using the tools that we have of critical thought, uh, debate, and and yeah, that, that I think we have to have some faith in that. So I I, I want to kind of ask you this one piece here that that um, <laughs> you have some great lines in here like like any other racism, anti-Semitism can exist in the absence of intent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think, and it just sh- it, it shows how deeply it, it, it's it, how pervasive racism and anti-Semitism yes. are. It can completely. And I, I do want to, yeah, there's one comment I, I, I would like to make on that. And then an additional point about free speech. I didn't, I didn't quite make. I also just want to say that one, one, you know, one thing I often hear um, by well-intentioned people, you know, who want to kind of um, support me and in, in, who wanted to support me in terms of when I was accused of anti-Semitism was that, you know, oh, that's a Jewish name. You're, you have Jewish heritage, so you can't be anti-Semitic. But I actually don't agree with that. I, I, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't think I'm anti-Semitic, but it's not, I don't think that there's, there's no get out of jail free card from any identity. Anyone <laughs> is vulnerable to any kind of racism, any kind of bad thinking. And we, we shouldn't personalize, personalizing it that way doesn't help us. Right. So, yeah. So that, that I think that's, that's absolutely true. It's, it goes well beyond intent. It's structural and it's material as well. Um, and the other thing about free speech and kind of what I, what my actual experience, you know, of being accused of something and then defending myself against the accusation in the university taught me is that, is that yes, you know, I, I certainly would want to be part of the, the movement that, that challenges racist thought. Anti- I want to be part of the movement that challenges anti-Semitic thought. But the problem is, is that when you, you have to think very, very carefully about what kind of agencies and agents, like institutions, are you empowering? Not you personally, obviously, but it, it, you know, when, we, when we create regulations or laws, but particularly this kind of like the IHRA definition is not technically a law, but it kind of functions as a law right, sometimes. Right. We, we, we create these regulations that are kind of um, aimed to eradicate a certain way of thinking or a certain uh, approach of certain mental attitude, right? Um, just by very, by creating that law, by, by basically creating an, a bureaucracy for their implementation, we are empowering certain kinds of institutions to um, to punish, right, or to or to marginalize. And so it's, it's for me, it's not just a question of like the content of, you know, what's right and what's wrong. It's about power. So if you're creating a regulation, you're giving an institution, you're giving a government, like the conservative government, in this case, the conservative government of the UK and their various apparatuses, you're empowering them to do certain things to silence certain points of view. And I think, so I think that that's problematic, entirely separate of what of the content of what's being supported and not. It's, it's also about power. And I think that's important to remember about speech. So I, I wonder what conclusion you come to. And let's talk, I mean, I, I, could, mm-hmm. I could read 10 different passages here, but <laughs> we, we, we only have so much time. Right? And, and right. how you would see anti-Semitism, the role it played in forcing people to go to Palestine, as you quote Deutscher, mm-hmm. creating this oppressive system with Palestinians, and how you see it, how do you see that changing? I mean, I, you have these great lines in here about around how how the anti-Semitism, the ending of it, is wrapped up in the liberation of Palestinians. It's, yes, you know, I mean, it's like the, right. It's almost time for new definitions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think that I, I guess one way of sort of responding to that is that you know historically um, there have been intersections between. The Jewish Jewish people, a Jewish experience and Palestinian experience. If you go back right, centuries, but I think at this particular moment, twenty first century, their their histories are becoming ever more intertwined. Uh, and there's a there's a great quote that uh, Edward Said uh, once 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 used, or uh, that uh, the Palestinians are the Jews of the Arab world. I think that that kind of I, yes, he, yes. He, yeah. he and I actually talked about mm-hmm. that one day on my on my radio show. Yes, yes. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's yeah, wonderful. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's I think what what I what I had in mind when I wrote that that at this point the histories are not separable. And in a sense, that's I mean that's a good thing. Uh, that that that's where we have it, that's where there's a kind of potential for violence, but that's also where where there's a potential for for peace. It's it's the 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 parallels they've they've intersected so closely, and uh, I think yeah I think there's um. A role for understanding the Nakba and the Holocaust was also being intertwined. So, how do you think? Listen, how do you think, given all you wrote and the people you wrote about, mm-hmm. and the kind of demise of the, um, in some ways of the of the power of the left and the Jewish Marxist left at any rate that you mm-hmm. that you write about, how that mm-hmm. fits into all this in terms of the future landscape? 
um, mm -hmm. because it does change things. I mean, it changes things yes. drastically. Sure. Well, I think one thing that this shows, I mean, potentially some of the most important thinkers on this issue have often, or, or the important thinkers in, in general in terms of creating revolutionary change have often been from the diaspora. Um, and it may be, I mean, I think historically the, the, the American diaspora, for example, has, a, 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 uh, or yeah, I, I think there, there's a potential for the diaspora to, to change the conversation, uh, to some extent. I mean, the, a lot of Palestinians are, are, are leaving, Israelis are leaving their country and it may be that they'll find, um, in, in migration, some kind of space, uh, for creating, creating communities that are, that are very difficult to create in the ground. I suppose that's 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 one. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of that. That's that's a that's a pattern that one sees also in the the Jew the, in the Polish Jews of the 19th century and the early 20th that they they created new worlds like Emma Goldman, you know, when they when they migrated. Yep. yep. So. Yeah, and, and I also find that a lot of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of these Israelis on the left are now in Europe. Uh huh. They're not there that's, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> They're gone. I mean, a hundred percent. That's true. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and that and I think the way you frame that in terms of the the Jewish Marxist tradition and what that really has to teach, mm -hmm. I mean, and even when you write about Isaac Deutscher's development and his change, yeah. mm -hmm. when he, what happened in nineteen sixty seven, how that really changed the way before he just before he died, how that how that really kind of changed his whole view of what was going on, because as a Holocaust survivor, he was like, yes, we want Israel, but then what just happened? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think if you look at the scholarship being produced by by Israeli Israelis in Europe, um, who are yeah have, have, are very critical um, of their country and of that history, uh, it is it definitely gives us a new way of seeing that the history and the legacy, and and then therefore a new way of seeing the future. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I really do recommend getting this book, Erasing Palestine, by Rebecca Ruth Gould. It's engrossing and worth the read to wrestle with the ideas she puts forth. It's an easy read about a complex subject. So thank you, Rebecca. Good to have you with us. I'm really happy you could join us today. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. And I want to thank Cameron Grandino on the other side of the glass making his studio magic and Kilo Rivara for making the wheels turn here and allowing all this to happen. And everyone at Real News for making this show possible. Please let me know what you thought about what you heard today and what you'd like us to cover. Uh, just write to me at mss at therealnews.com. I'll get right back to you. And while you're there, please go to www.therealnews.com forward slash support, become a monthly donor, become part of the future with us. So for, for Pamela Gandino, Kelly Rivera, the crew here at The Real News, and our guest, Rebecca Gould, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.